Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Hope you had a good lunch. Um, I'm Ariel Dushur, also one of the R3s, and today we are going to talk about inhalant use disorder, um, sort of a brief introduction. I chose this topic because it's something that I didn't know a whole lot about, um, but had encountered a couple of times um, in medical school and also in residency. Um, so I was hoping to start um, today with a case. Um, this is a case that is similar to something that one of my colleagues experienced and then kind of modified a little bit. Um, so you're working in the ER and a 24 year old woman is brought in by her roommate. Um, the patient and the roommate say that the patient for the past two weeks has been kind of uncoordinated, falling frequently. Um, the patient tells you that she feels like her feet are going numb um, and it's getting worse. Um, she doesn't disclose any prior medical history. She says she's only taking OCPs as medications. She hasn't had any recent like viral illnesses or other illnesses, fevers, anything like that. Um, her exam is pretty unremarkable. She's a little on the thin side. Her BMI is 19. She's got a normal heart rate and blood pressure. But on exam, you notice that she has a positive Romberg and she appears to be mildly ataxic. And she's got some increased sensation to light touch of both of her feet and legs. Um, but her strength is intact. So in the ER, you get some basic labs. Um, her urine drug screen is negative um, and she is mildly anemic, hemoglobin of 10 and her MCV is 105. Um, so you admit her to the hospital, get a neural consult and the plan is to do an LP because you're concerned that she has Guillain-Barre syndrome. And we will follow up on that later. And we can kind of guess what's actually going on based on the name <laughs> of the talk. Um, Okay, um, so our learning objectives for today um, is I'm hoping by the end of this talk, we can discuss the epidemiology of inhalant use um, and learn about the names and the methods of use because there are several. Um, we can identify the warning signs of when to be concerned that a patient might have an inhalant use disorder um, and to understand the risks and the medical complications that can arise from both acute and chronic inhalant use. Um, so the first question I kind of wanted to talk about are what are inhalants? It's a really broad group of substances um, and encompasses a lot of different things that people can abuse. Um, so inhalants are in three big broad categories. So the first is volatile hydrocarbons. Um, so that's things like gasoline, toluene, other industrial chemicals. Um, the next category that is a large category is nitrous oxides and the last is nitrites. Um, today, we'll primarily focus on volatile hydrocarbons because of the, those are the most commonly abused substances and tend to have the most medical complications. Um, all of the inhalants um, work in similar ways. They are inhaled and then they're absorbed across the pulmonary capillaries and they work on GABA and glutamate receptors, sort of similar to alcohol, um, and they cause CNS depressant effects from this. Um, the use of inhalants, the, the onset is very rapid within seconds and the, the effect usually lasts anywhere between 15 and 30 minutes. Um, because of that, users will often sort of stack their use to get a longer effect. Um, and inhalants, in addition to causing CNS depressants, sort of the um, effects people use them for is it causes euphoria and impaired judgment, and then usually things like impaired coordination and even lethargy. Um, nitrates we'll talk about a little bit more specifically because they have some additional effects, including um, vasodilation and hypotension. Um, so they're used for more specific purposes. Um, so the most commonly used substances in the United States, so the biggest category of use, and this is not all encompassing, is toluene. Um, toluene is an industrial chemical. It's found in things like glue and shoe polish and markers, white out, things like that. Um, the second biggest use, about 25%, is volatile hydrocarbons, which is primarily gasoline. 23% um, is something that is just commonly known as whiffets, which is nitrous oxide, also known as laughing gas. And then the last 25% is a mix, so that includes other um, substances that can be abused and also nitrites. Um, so uh, methods of use. So there are several different ways that people use these substances, and I think it's important to understand um, sort of the terminology people might use. Um, so sniffing is when people inhale the substance from an open container. So that would be like a carton of gasoline um, or even just like holding a marker up to your nose. Um, huffing is having a cloth that's saturated with the substance and then placing that over the nose and mouth. Um, bagging is the most dangerous method of inhalant use. And so in that method, people will fill a bag with whatever kind of gas that it is and put it over the head. 
Um, whippets and poppers are very specific. So whippets um, are sold in these little, what they call them, whipped cream canisters, which is why they're called whippets. Um, and people can use a variety of devices that you can see in these pictures to um, release the gas into a balloon and then the balloon is then huffed. Um, and then poppers are sold in little individual containers that can be sniffed from. Um, so the epidemiology, so inhalant use for the most part is a substance that's primarily used by young people. Um, there's a lot of reasons why that is. You know, a lot of these things, you think about gasoline, markers, whiteout, they have a lot of legitimate uses. And so they're unlikely to arouse suspicion when people have these in their room or around their house. They're very inexpensive and they can be purchased at drug store, drug stores, excuse me, grocery stores, kind of anywhere. Um, so in terms of the youth starting young, um, in the United States, when you look at the population of 12 people who are greater than 12 years old, 9% of the US population has used inhalant sometime in their life. Um, and use tends to peak around seventh or eighth grade. Um, and for people who use inhalants, 58% first started using by ninth grade. So they're really like a substance of younger folks, um, particularly the volatile hydrocarbons. Um, it's associated with a lower level of parental education and more common amongst white and Latinx youth that they'll use uh, excuse me, inhalants. Um, if you look at this graph here, this is a study that was done in Australia and they looked at um, teenagers and who had used inhalants um, in the past year, and this was done in 2014, you can see that the use sort of peaks around that seventh and eighth grade time and then sort of starts to drop off. Um, poppers and whippets are unique because those tend to be more used by older folks and they're more of like a club or a party drug. Um, there are a lot of associated health risks with using inhalants. Um, I think primarily is because these are substances that were not intended for human consumption. Um, so unfortunately that can be very risky. Um, it's hard to get data on this because these are substances that often aren't tested for. They're not easy to test for, um, but they did find there were about 167 deaths that were primarily attributed to inhalant use um, in a 10 year period between 1998 and 2008. Um, butane, propane, and air freshener usage is the most likely to be associated with death and morbidity. Um, because these substances are more affordable and less likely to arouse suspicion than other substances that intend to be used by youth, they are a marker of transition to adult use of other substances. Um, so there was a study that was done of 600 adults, um, and they found that if the people in the study had used inhalants by age 16, they were nine times more likely to start using heroin by age 32, so super significant. Um, there's also a strong association between inhalant use and mental health concerns. Um, especially major depression, suicidality, and conduct disorder. So there was a study that was done of high schoolers. Um, they looked at high schoolers who used inhalants and those who did not use inhalants. Um, and they found that of the high schoolers who used inhalants, 21% of them reported they had had a suicide attempt in the past year as compared to 6% of non-users. So hard to know if you know, the inhalants cause depression or if youth who are depressed are more likely to use inhalants, but there's definitely a strong association. Um, so the medical complications from inhalants, as you can see from this picture, it affects like basically every organ system in the body. Um, but I just wanted to highlight some of the things that you might see on physical exam when a patient comes in who uses chronic inhalants because they often um, are not disclosed. People might not consider them to be drugs because they're purchased over the counter. Um, so one thing that you'll often see is people with chronic use will develop like a perioral dermatitis or rash around their nose and mouth. Um, people will often have dilated pupils when they're acutely intoxicated. They'll be vomiting. Um, people usually get wheezing with chronic use. Um, you'll notice slurred speech, mood swings, nosebleeds, and then people can also present with acute anemias, kidney injury, and hepatitis. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about certain medical complications from particular groups of inhalants. Um, so one of the most sort of striking is the long-term complications of volatile hydrocarbon use. Um, so they have a lot of neurological effects. Um, the acute usage can cause ataxia, slurred speech, headache, hallucination, violence, and even seizures. Um, and then toluene is something that has been studied because it has very specific effects on the brain. Um, so they found that chronic toluene use causes cerebellar dysfunction, cranial neuropathy. And the reason that it does this is because it causes a white matter degeneration and can eventually lead to a dementia um, from cerebellar leukoencephalopathy.
Um, so there's been a lot of studies on this. There are small studies. Um, so if you look at the image to your left, um, these are looking at brain scans of chronic toluene users. Um, they didn't identify what chronic meant to them in this study, um, but you can see in the pictures A to B to C um, going towards the right shows worsening dementia symptoms. And you can see um, that there's some increased white matter signals. So even for us who aren't really radiologists, you can tell that there's a lot more white matter density in the brains that have more severe disease. Then the image on the right, this is the study of 20 patients um, who use chronic toluene. Again, they didn't quantify what chronic meant, um, but of the 20 patients that they scanned, they found that eight of them had significant atrophy for their age on CT scans. Um, so you can see some of the findings in these images. Um, they show thinning of the corpus callosum. They have increased ventricular size. Um, and again, that white matter hyperintensity from that white matter degeneration. And unfortunately, these things tend to not be reversible and can lead to that early onset dementia. Um, gasoline um, is a volatile hydrocarbon as well that tends to have very specific effects um, from long-term and acute youth. Uh, use, excuse me. Um, so gasoline tends to be associated with um, peripheral neuropathy, myopathy, and Parkinsonianism. It can cause metabolic acidosis, glomerular nephritis, um, aplastic anemia. And then there's a phenomenon known as sudden sniffing death. It's very rare. Um, there's only been a couple of reports of this, but it's something that can affect young people and be very significant. Um, so what happens with gasoline is the inhalation will cause inhibition of sodium, calcium, and potassium channels which can lead to a prolonged QT, which with exertion can cause torsades and lead to sudden cardiovascular collapse. So there have been cases of healthy youth who um, inhale gasoline having this sudden cardiac death. Um, another important thing to talk about is how growth and metabolism is affected by chronic inhalant use, especially because many of the users are young people. Um, so anorexia is a pretty prominent side effect of to uh, toluene use because it accumulates in many organs in the body, um, including in the brain. Um, and this causes decrease of a, um, a hormone called neuropeptide Y, which decreases um, appetite. Um, so the data on this is kind of hard to find, but I did find a study that looked at indigenous populations in Australia. They looked at 118 um, young men. The data was collected in the early 90s. Um, they found of these 118 young males that 86% had chronic inhalation of gas use in their adolescence, and they matched them with other controls. And these were all um, young people who were from the same community, grew up and went to the same schools. Um, they found of the folks who used gasoline, the average age of onset was age 12. And then the study participants were average age of 20. Those who had used inhalants had used them for the past eight years. Um, and they found that comparing the young people who used chronic gasoline compared to those who didn't, um, those who used chronic gasoline were an average of five centimeters shorter and seven kilograms lighter at age 20. Um, this is controlling for all substance use as well, aside from gasoline. Um, so really significant um, impairment in obtaining adult height. Um, um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about to sort of switch gears is nitrous oxide, also known as whippets. Um, this is a pretty commonly used substance amongst older patients. Um, it's also called nags, buzz bombs, and balloons. Um, so whippets is associated with polyneuropathy, ataxia, and even psychosis. Um, and the way that this happens is because chronic whippet use causes neurotoxicity. Um, whip, the nitrous oxide causes deactivation of vitamin B12. Um, it converts it to its inactive form. So then you get buildup of these toxic intermediaries like homocysteine and meth methylmalonyl. Um, and that can lead to that anemia and polyneuropathy that potentially can be reversible with B12 supplementation. Um, poppers also sort of occupy kind of a unique um, segment of the inhalant use um, sphere. Um, just like with whippets, poppers are legal. They're not marketed for human consumption, um, but they are legal. You can buy them in drugstores, sex shops, all sorts of different places, smoke shops. Um, so poppers um, are something that you often see sort of as a club drug. Um, poppers cause smooth muscle relaxation. And so they're often used when people are engaging in anal intercourse. Um, and again, there's something that you can just buy basically anywhere. Um, they found um, in a study between 2015 and 2017 that 3% of all US adults had used poppers, but there's a much higher use rate amongst people who identify as sexual minorities. 
Um, so amongst 35% of people who engage in um, anal, penal intercourse um, were found that they had used poppers at one point in their life. Um, so poppers don't have as many chronic risks as other inhalants, but I think it's still something that it's important to be aware of because they're very commonly used amongst our patients. Um, chronic use can cause retinopathy, um, but something to keep in mind is that acute use, if they're combined with phosphodiesterase inhibitors like Viagra, can lead to a life-threatening hypotension and shock. Um, so I do think it's important to counsel patients who might be in some of these risk groups about um, safe use of poppers. Um, poppers are also associated with an increased use of high-risk sexual behavior. Um, so if you look at this graph at the right, um, this was a study of 475 um, people who identified as cisgender men in China. Um, and they followed them over two years. And these were men who identified as having penile anal intercourse. Um, and when they adjusted for all other covariants, including age, ethnicity, level of education, monthly income, the people who used poppers over the two-year period had a four times um, hazards ratio of HIV seroconversion over the two years. Um, so you can see that the green line is people who don't use poppers and the red line is people who do use poppers and statistically significant increase in HIV acquisition. So I think that kind of highlights the importance of needing to talk about this with patients and provide some harm reduction strategies for them if they are going to use poppers. Um, so acute management, um, if you do have patients who present with um, acute intoxication on inhalants, um, because there is that risk for sudden cardiac death, it's important that these folks get continuous cardiac monitoring and oxygen monitoring. Um, some of the abnormalities you might note on labs is folks tend to have um, bone marrow suppression and will be found to be anemic. There can be electrolyte disturbances from a metabolic acidosis. People often have hepatitis um, or renal tubular acidosis. Um, nitrates can raise methemoglobin levels. Um, unfortunately, a eutox is not really helpful in these situations because it, these are substances that are not commonly tested for, um, which I think really highlights needing to have some index of suspicion for these substances, especially again, because people often won't think of them as being um, recreational drugs because they're not marketed as such um, and they're able to be purchased over the counter. Um, chronic treatment for inhalant use disorder is not very well studied, unfortunately. There's not a lot of good evidence-based um, recommendations for how to treat this in folks, uh, but there is some evidence for some of the atypical antipsychotics and for mood stabilizers. So things like carbamazepine and lamictal have been shown to possibly give you some benefit. Um, so just to pop back to our case um, before we conclude. So this patient, as you can remember, was admitted because she had acute onset of neuropathy and weakness and ataxia. Um, so after she's admitted, um, the patient's roommate approaches the medical team and lets the medical team know that the patient is a heavy whippet user. Um, so you get some labs and show that she does have a low B12 and a high methylmalonyl CoA. And when you do an MRI, you find that she has degeneration of the dorsal column of the spinal cord and so is having some complications from whippet use. Um, so in conclusion, um, it's important to know that youth inhalant use is quite risky and it is associated with an increase in mental illness, um, medical complications, and also um, transition to heroin use as adults. Um, it's important to counsel patients about these risks. And I think one thing that I learned just by doing this topic was that it's important to ask. I don't really ask patients about inhalant use, especially young patients, but I think it's important. Um, and then for things like whippets and nitrates that are heavily used by certain adult populations to make sure that you have that harm reduction conversation with patients about it. Okay, um, those are my references if anybody has any questions.